Great. Um, yeah, hi everybody. Um, really great to see you. I'm Amy Heiger. I'm the, the president of the PTL union um, and a PTL at Rutgers since the late 1990s in political science mostly. Um, this is our last town hall of the spring semester. <laughs> it's hard to believe the semester's almost over. We have two big topics that we wanna discuss with everybody. Um, one is the status of our merger campaign and the other is something that we're, um, we wanna discuss with you called open bargaining, high participation bargaining. Um, and let me just give you a big overview of where we've been for the last few months. Um, we've been really busy this spring. Um, we're kind of, I, I see us, and I think we should all feel part of the sweeping labor union organizing that's happening around the country. Um, it really does feel, at least to me, I don't know how you're, you're all feeling, but that people are realizing that change is hard, but that it will never happen unless we make it happen ourselves. Right? We are coming together as workers to demand change. And um, it's, you know, we have to face it those who are most exploited <laughs> have to really work the hardest to come together because we work so much, but it's gonna happen because we come together. Um, and we are the contingent workers of the university, of higher ed, um, and that's what we're doing. And that's the way we win. Unions are winning across the country when they do join together. It's, uh, it's about mobilizing our membership. So I wanna uh, just start by thanking everybody who has stepped up this spring. And there are so many of you, I can't possibly name you all, but I hope you know who you are. Um, you've, you've volunteered for a phone bank, you've knocked on doors, you've visited classrooms, you've come to our happy hours and department meetings, you've joined our committees. Um, I'm gonna call out three people though, who I need to call out. So just uh, indulge me for a minute. Um, and these people are probably not going to be thrilled that I'm calling them out, but I'm going to do it anyway. And if we were in a room, I'd ask them to stand up, but they can be thankful they're not in a room, but on Zoom. The first person is Emily Rosenzweig. Uh, you can find her on your screen. She is our lead organizer, our superstar organizer, who has been leading the way with this merger campaign. And it has been astonishing to see what she's done. Um, she hasn't done it by herself, of course, and then she'd be the first to say that, but she has led the way and figured out all new ways of reaching our members. Um, and I feel like sometimes I'm going to be, I'm waiting for a call from her union. Now the staff has a union to say, you know, Emily's working too many hours, you know, she's working weekends, you should stop it. And she's, well, she's doing this because she feels so strongly about what we're doing here. And I cannot thank her enough. Um, Molly Erner uh, started working with us uh, full time at the beginning of March. Um, she is an organizer and doing our media outreach. Uh, last June, Molly uh, got her degree from Rutgers in the master's program in English in Camden. And she started teaching middle school. And this is what she told us on our interview. She said, I love what I'm doing, but I really want to be in a place where I can make structural change. And I don't think I can do that so much in the classroom. I need to be outside of that. And where do you go in 2022 to make structural change? You go to a union <laughs> and you work with people who want to make that kind of change. So thank you, Molly. You're doing a fantastic job. Um, and lastly, and not leastly, <laughs> I want to call out Angela Magdella. Angela, um, uh, Anjali, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Anjali Magdella. She has been working with us since the summer. She uh, is, quote, part-time, but uh, I couldn't even describe the things she's been doing because she's been doing everything we, we need her to do. Um, knocking on doors, making phone calls, doing media, memes, whatever, you know, designing stickers this week. Um, she's incredible. She graduated from Rutgers last June um, and, or last May from the English department in New Brunswick. And I feel every day that she is the kind of student that I am at Rutgers to teach. Um, I watch her just growing as a person and she is gonna go out there in the world. She already has started this to change it. And I know that's why many of us are at Rutgers to see these kinds of students graduate and go on to do that. So um, thank you all three of you inspire me. Um, what have they helped us do? We've knocked on over 160 doors with eight canvas days. We've had four phone banks. We're having a fifth tomorrow night at six o'clock. Join us, join the fun. Um, there'll be a link in the chat. We've made over 7,000 phone calls. We've called every single member of this union many times. If you've gotten calls from us many times, uh, we, are, we are a little bit of a pest, but that's what you got to do. So thank you for picking up. 
Um, we've had happy hours. We've had five department meetings. We've had three town halls. We've hired 11 part-time organizers. This week, we sent out 1,300 postcards to, to uh, members in our bargaining unit. If you get one, it means you haven't signed the merger card. Please sign, and we'll stop bothering you. Uh, we have 87 new members this spring. That is a, sh a huge number. And here's dun -da -da -dum. we have 922 merger cards signed. 922, which is a phenomenal number. We've never had that much response from anything. Uh, we have a few hundred more to go. We can do it and we will do it by the end of the semester. Um, but I said we're, the town hall is about our merger and about open bargaining. So I just very quickly wanna say that we had our first uh, meeting with the university on bargaining this Monday. Um, Brian Sachs and I were sitting on a Zoom call and it reminded me of why the merger is so important. Um, it was a pre-meeting for a pre-meeting, right? It was about setting up meetings. And we were sitting at the table and to quote table on Zoom. Um, there were 12 people from the Office of Academic Labor Relations and they have all the time in the world, right? This is their one job to work with unions, but they have all the time in the world to work out contracts for 13 unions, right? We wanna make it more efficient. We wanna merge and let them do it together, sit at the same bargaining table. They don't wanna do that. They're very happy to let it drag out. Uh, they have their raises, they have their benefits, right? Come September 1st, when we go back you know, to teaching, if we're not teaching this summer, we are basically getting a pay cut because of inflation, right? We're not, we, we, we don't have benefits, we don't have job security. Um, they're all sitting pretty. So with that number of, we had 15 union people on the call from the Coalition of Unions, I felt powerful. I felt like we can do this together. Right? If we're on our own at a bargaining table, off in a corner, we're not going to get that much. But together with this power, we are, we are going to win something here. So the merger is central to what we're trying to do. Um, and I'm going to share one brief statistic that I want everybody on this call to memorize because it's really important. If you take away one thing, remember this fact. AFT National has just updated its contingent faculty report called an army of, te of temps. And they interviewed hundreds of PTLs or adjunct faculty across the country. And here's something we should all know, right? 40 years ago, 70% of faculty positions were tenured or on tenure track, right? Today, 75% of faculty are not eligible for tenure, that's job security. And 40% of these individuals are holding part-time jobs, right? Most of whom wanna work full-time, right? Most of the part-time survey respondents have been working as contingent faculty for seven years or more, right? That is terrible for part-time faculty, but it's also terrible for education. How do we change this? Higher ed labor unions. So we need to be realistic, it's gonna be hard, uh, the administration has enormous power. We all know the kind of power they have, but we have power too. And it's in our numbers, right? Administrators cannot do our jobs, uh, their jobs without our labor. So uh, for bargaining and open bargaining, the second part of our town hall, we are very excited to have a special guest from Oregon State University, Marissa Chappelle, and we will um, hear more from her in a minute uh, and more of her background. But I wanna quickly, um, turn it over to um, another person that we really should call out and thank, and that's Matt Midget. He's on our board. He's a grad student in the English department in Camden. He's a PTL. He's gonna talk about his experience with the merger campaign. So Matt, you ready? Yep. Hey everyone. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard my voice on the other end of the line and maybe are sick of it. Um, well, now you have a face to put with that voice. Um, if this is your first time seeing me. I'm glad you all can make it. I just wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, the member organizer experience this semester, since I'm one of the, uh, what, nearly a dozen people that are working part time each week to try to get people to sign merger cards, let everyone know about our demands, um, and get PTLs to join the union and just meet PTLs. Um, which has been my favorite part. Um, so we've done a lot of canvassing. I've been to two of them, I believe. Um, and though that's the best, um, the most exciting way to organize and to, uh, it's been the most exciting part about this campaign for me so far, because you're not in your room alone making calls to a person whose face you can't see, you know, you're out there, you're, um, you know, 
meeting these PTLs face to face and, and getting a few minutes to just speak to them and to, and a lot of times just complain with them and, and uh, feel validated that you're not, you know, you're not the crazy one. Like other people want things to change at Rutgers too. Um, but it's just been really great to, you know, speak with uh, everyone, uh, whether or not they're in the union this semester. Um, and it's been cool to learn the campus. Rutgers Camden is where I teach um, in and out. You know, it, it's a cool feeling going into some building that's tucked away that maybe a few dozen people go in every day. And there's already a union poster in there because someone's already, you know, postered um, for me, which is what I found. Um, but also to just, you know, talk to people who do completely different things from me and find that we still have things in common, even though a lot of times that thing is how Rutgers takes advantage of us. Um, so I'd encourage any of you who haven't, you know, come to a phone bank, haven't canvassed yet, um, even haven't sent out texts or, or, or emails, um, you know, no matter how much time you have um, to dedicate to this campaign, there's something for you to do. There's a place for you to be a part of it. Um, so if you're, you're, you're on the edge there, or if you feel like it's, um, you know, there's no hope, the best thing to do is to get involved because the, the times I feel most hopeful are when I'm out there like talking to the other PTLs. Um, but that's all I have. Um, I think it's, I think I'll be passing it over to Bob. Um, so thanks for the, the short time. Yeah, let me just tell you who Bob is, but Matt, Matt, thank you. You couldn't have said it any better than you just said it. English major, English master, as we can tell. Um, so Bob Boykus uh, is a tenured faculty member in the Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology, uh, has been at Rutgers for, get this, 54 years. <laughs> He's been active in the union since the 1970s. He was the chief negotiator for three contracts. And he's co-chair of the Academic Freedom Committee in the Union. So, Bob, thank you so much for being here to talk about the merger. Yeah, so, so just a brief historical interlude. Uh, when I first started teaching, there was virtually no such thing as adjunct faculty. And uh, almost everybody was tenure track. And in those days, the faculty were clearly in charge of the university. And uh, since, I guess, since the middle 70s or so, administrators have figured out that uh, they can't be in charge if the faculty is in charge. And the way to deal with the faculty is to have as many faculty as possible who uh, have no job security, who don't make too much money, and who can be pushed around by the administration. And uh, if you look at Rutgers, for example, Rutgers is one of the worst cases in the last 20 years, our student body has increased by 15,000 students and the number of tenured faculty has decreased. So it's clear what's going on here. And real faculty salaries, tenure track faculty salaries haven't really increased very much over the last 20 or so years. And uh, we know that uh, part-time lecturers are being paid uh, a very, very small fraction of what tenure faculty are paid. And we know, all know where all that money is going, which is it's going to the administration. The administration has, has grown tremendously. And I think that the faculty have to realize that we're all in this together. It's clear that if the administration had their way, they probably would get rid of the tenure faculty altogether because the tenure faculty just interfere with what it is they want to do. Uh, so I think the tenure, it's just as important for the tenure faculty to realize what's going on as for everybody else. And one of the things that always surprised me is uh, people act as if getting tenure was the equivalent of getting sainthood. All tenure is, is they can't fire you without just cause. And just imagine if they can't fire you without just cause, how restricted the administration would be and what it is they wanna do. So I think it's critical for the faculty to speak with one voice. We all have to have academic freedom. It's clear that if, if, you're, if you can be dismissed at the whim of anybody, you can't say what's really on your mind. So adjunct faculty certainly don't have the academic freedom that would come with tenure. And it's very important for them to have academic freedom because if they don't, it means that the administration can do all kinds of things and people can't speak up against it. So I think that the, I think the merger is really critically important because we're all in this together. And it's clear if you look at the political situation in this country and you look at other states, there are a lot of people that would like to get rid of tenure completely. 
And one way they're trying is to pass statutes, but another way to get rid of tenure completely is to just have all adjunct faculty. So I think we have to take that option away from the people who are interested in molding higher education in the way that they see, uh, in a way they see is consistent with their political ambitions. So uh, I, I just hope that the merger does go through and that we all uh, can bargain as, as with one voice. Thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you so much, Bob. <laughs> that was really important thank to hear. You, thank you for getting this together. Yeah, um, thanks. And that actually is a, a really nice lead in to Brian Sachs, who's our vice president, to talk about what we're trying to do in our contract. Um, so Brian. Sure, thanks. Next Andy. contract, yeah. Absolutely, I'll, and uh, I wanna say hi to everybody and uh, say that it's great to see people here at what is so difficult a time I should be teaching. Um, and I'm sure many people are, but um, despite that, uh, it's really great to see to see new faces, to see new faces that I haven't seen before at our town halls, and also members like Bob and Hassan and others from um, our uh, our sibling union. Um, that's really great. We really are in it together. And so, uh, as Amy indicated, uh, I wanted to run through uh, two of our most important contract demands that. Uh, our bargaining team is planning to advance once we begin contract negotiations. These demands, I think, express what PTLs indicated were most important to them in our contract survey. Make me summarize just briefly as equal pay for equal work and job security. First, regarding equal pay for equal work, we will be proposing fractional appointments as a way of resolving pay disparities with our full-time non-tenure track colleagues. Our proposal currently calls for PTLs to receive compensation that amounts to at minimum the same amount paid to NTTs with comparable duties on a pro rata basis. So in other words, uh, if an NTT with comparable teaching duties to a PTL is making $96,000 for teaching eight courses per year in a department where eight courses a year is the standard load, any PTL performing similar duties must be paid the equivalent amount for their teaching on a fractional basis. So if a PTL were to teach four courses in that same period of time, for instance, they would be paid a minimum of $48,000. In effect, this proposal treats PTLs as NTTs who teach less. And this is among our leading proposals for this contract campaign and it's what our members told us, not in so many words, but what our members told us was, was critical to them. Uh, I'm very glad to report that the full-time faculty grad unit has agreed to jointly propose this to the administration with us. Some of you may know, but many of you may not, that uh, back in the last contract campaign cycle, full-time faculty grad unit made their own proposal for fractional appointments and making it together with us um, both shows the solidarity that we currently have with the full-time faculty grad unit and um, the importance of um, being together on these key demands uh, if we, you know, if we hope to win them. Second, um, the, the second proposal is in the area of job security. And we've created uh, a new titling system for PTLs that would provide them, uh, any PTL that's uh, earned their third appointments with a minimum one-year appointment. So by the third appointment a PTL had, they would get a minimum one year appointment. All subsequent appointments would then cover a period of three years, uh, unless the PTL doesn't wish for an appointment of that length. Uh, this would be a critically important improvement in our working conditions, I think it's needless to say. Uh, there's a number of other uh, changes that we're proposing that are intended to strengthen our job security and make our compensation fairer. But these two uh, proposals are the highlights. And I'll just close by saying, um, I imagine it's clear to people, but if it's not, we should be very clear. These provisions would be historic in their sweep here at Rutgers for PTLs, and they are gonna be fought tooth and nail by the administration. Um, I don't think there's any question about that. And if these provisions are ones that you think are worth fighting for, let's prepare ourselves to fight for them. We're gonna to have to fight for them. 
And uh, I wanted to say, uh, finally, finally, hello to Marissa. It's great to see you. Um, not on a Friday afternoon or not at a High Red Labor United meeting, but at a you know, good old fashioned town hall. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, Karen put in the chat, uh, peace work to parody, I like that, it's great. That's what he's talking about. So we have a few minutes for questions. So we, you know, we don't like to talk at people, you shouldn't teach that way, you shouldn't run town halls that way. So what uh, questions or thoughts do people have about what we've proposed, especially what Brian just explained? Um, in the chat, do we have a number costed out basis on average or other benchmark? For NTTs, well, we know we, we it's hard because every NTT in every department is a different story. How many, what their course load is, whether they do non uh, coursework for their salaries, but we do have an average um, that we are working from. So I'm going to actually turn it to either Brian or um, somebody who's been looking at the numbers. Yeah, I mean, I can also reply to that, Joe. That, that is important to have, and that's something that we're going to want to have when we sit down at the table for sure. I sit on the uh, um, full-time faculty grad units, uh, universities budget and priorities committee, where uh, much of that costing out will happen for not just our proposals, but for their proposals and the ones that we're making jointly. So um, no, absolutely, it's, it's in the way. Um, any Can I ask a question? Yeah. About there are PTLs who are teaching a full load. Or well, sometimes even more than a full load. Is there a proposal on the table that any PTL who's teaching a full load has to get full benefits as well as the comparable salary? This would be part of the comprehensive proposal uh, for fractional appointments, but it's also separable. We don't necessarily want it to be separable, but Karen Thompson has been among the PTLs who's led the, you know, been the leading voice in saying for many years, you know, from what I understand and in the few years that I know, that PTLs ought to be converted to NTTs if they're teaching full time. Right. I've, been one, I've been one of those PTLs, Bob, for eight of the last 16 or 17 semesters, and I've not once been converted. But um, Karen's absolutely right, as are the others who've been championing this for a long time. And to me, I, I mean, I don't want to talk strategy here, you know, in detail, but um, it's got to come at absolute minimum this cycle. Yeah, um, I think Howie, yeah, you can put your name, let's put stack in the chat and then you know you have a question. Just wanted to add something to what Brian uh, summarized. Uh, in our proposal, proposed collective bargaining agreement, we're also um, demanding that summer and winter sessions be treated as regular semesters in, for purposes of pay, representation, and seniority. So uh, that's uh, currently, as mo as you know, I'm sure, they fall outside of our bargaining unit, which is a crazy and unjust thing. So that's another part of our demands. So technically, you could work um, w summer, winter, and fall, and that would count as three, three mm -hmm. semesters, for example. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, thanks, Howie. Joe, um, is that your question? You want to have another? Oh, you're asking to Howard, Howie. What what is what is the define question? Define the we. Define the we in um, in we. We are proposing. We, people who work summer and winter would be represented by the union, and um, covered by the contract, and their their service would count the same as people who work fall and and uh, spring. That's what the we is. The we in. Yeah. Um, so, do you want to ask another or that question or another question, Joe? You're in staff. You're on staff. Did I answer your question, Joe? Apologies. Thank you for the patience. Hello, everyone. Uh, first, first semester here, and uh, uh, yeah, I was just asking about the we are currently paid 0.08 oh. instead of the RU budget. Who's who's that? Who's that we? The PTLs. Okay. PTLs. That we okay. is. is is the, the aggregate salary, Joe, of PTLs at Rutgers makes up less than eight tenths of 1% of Rutgers total budget. That's not enough. <laughs> no, it's not. I teach 30% of the courses. Right. Over 30%. Over 30%. Over 30%. Yeah. One mask walking. Bob, do you have another question or you're just, uh, your hand is? 
your virtual hand. No? Okay. Uh, anybody else have a question? We can move, move on. If you don't, we have time for questions again. This is not the last opportunity. So um, let's go then to, uh, I think it's Dan, Dan Sidork. Hey, uh, yeah, so we're, we're going to uh, shift now to the, the other uh, important topic uh, today, and that's uh, about uh, open bargaining. What is open bargaining? Well, uh, the members of, of our union uh, recently uh, overwhelmingly passed a new set of bylaws. Uh, probably most of you uh, voted for them. They were uh, passed about 99% to 1%. Uh, and the, the new bylaws start with the statement that PTLFC is a democratic member-led union of adjunct faculty. Uh, and it also includes a new article stating the PTLFC as a democratic union will strive for maximum transparency in negotiations, including an open bargaining process that includes all workers covered by the collective bargaining agreement. Okay, now we've already begun this process with member run article committees. Uh, some of the, uh, the, the demands that you just heard that we're making uh, were arrived at by uh, this, by trying to implement this new democratic process. We put out a call for uh, members to join article committees. There, I guess, were eight or nine different committees that, that met together many times uh, and came up uh, with uh, our initial uh, draft version of our proposed articles. Um, and our bargaining team has endorsed open, the open bargaining process for the upcoming contract. Now, in the past, negotiations for a new contract uh, were held among a small group of union and university representatives behind closed doors who eventually hammered out a new proposed contract that we voted up or down. Uh, under our, our new member-led philosophy, we aim to change that process so that all members will be active participants throughout the process of negotiating a new contract. Uh, now, workers at many other universities are adopting this approach. Uh, for example, the, the Columbia Graduate Workers Union uh, has recently adopted this. Uh, they they uh, describe open bargaining as, uh, quote, a, a union negotiation procedure where all contract engagement between workers and their employer is conducted in transparent meetings open to all members of the union's bargaining unit. We believe that a commitment to open bargaining is an important part of internal transparency and democracy. In addition, this negotiating strategy helps to prevent university, negotiating, university negotiators from isolating our leadership and putting undue pressure on them behind the scenes. It allows for maximum participation of the members of our unit, encourages opportunities for workers to get actively involved in bargaining and bolsters our power as a collective. Now, uh, to help us learn about uh, how to make this new approach work, uh, we've invited Marissa Chappelle to join us tonight. Uh, Marissa teaches history at Oregon State University, uh, which has implemented a successful open bargaining process. Uh, Marissa is a member of the Executive Council of the Union there, the United Academics of Oregon State. Uh, she's a founding member of Scholars for a New Deal for Higher Education, and she's active in, in Higher Ed uh, Labor United, a national coalition in which our union is also an active member. Uh, after Marissa discusses open bargaining and her experiences at Oregon State, uh, we'll go into breakout rooms to discuss how open bargaining could work at Rutgers uh, to get your ideas and questions. Uh, Marissa, uh, thanks very much uh, for joining us tonight. Thanks, it's my pleasure. Um, and it's really exciting to hear about all the stuff you're doing. Amy, that was quite a list. So I'm from United Academics of OSU. We represent more than 2000 faculty, um, academic faculty, part-time, full-time, tenure track, non-tenure track, research and teaching faculty across all of OSU's campuses and extension stations in every county of the state. We ratified our first CBA in June 2020 after 18 months of negotiations. And we've been in bargaining since. We immediately filed a demand to bargain over COVID-19 related issues. We've done two rounds of impact bargaining and a salary reopener. As a new union, we had the benefit of setting precedents and our bargaining team, which was elected by our organizing committee, agreed that open bargaining should be one of those precedents. In fact, I don't remember any discussion about closed bargaining. It was sort of an assumption among all of us. Transparency is a core value and goal of our union. And we think that the university works better and the union works better with more eyes on the process. So how did we win open bargaining? It turns out that open bargaining was the most controversial element in our first meetings with administration when we were debating ground rules. 
The admin team raised numerous objections. They were concerned that an audience would be disruptive, would make our sessions inefficient. They argued that behind closed doors, we could build more trust and therefore reach agreement more easily. So we had three very frustrating sessions. Um, I've got children coming home, two seconds. I gotta tell them to be quiet. <laughs> hey, shush, shush, I'm in a meeting, okay? Shh. Okay, um, so we had three really frustrating sessions. And so for the next session, we just decided to bring faculty into the room. We turned out a few dozen members. Well, we didn't have members yet because we hadn't ratified a CBA, but we, we turned out uh, a few dozen faculty members to the next session. We got there early. Uh, we were organized. When the admin team entered the room, they were clearly shaken. Their lead negotiator demanded that everyone in the room stand and identify themselves. We said no. She said she felt intimidated and worried about her safety. Um, and, that, you know, statements like that, I'll have to say, really highlight one of the benefits of open bargaining, which is that your members get to hear some of the ridiculous things that administrators say. Um, and they really do. Um, so um, we noted in that session that ground rules were not a mandatory subject of bargaining and we could simply move forward without them and we had brought another article that we were ready to discuss. Um, this turned into them starting to talk about ground rules again and other aspects of the ground rules. And so essentially we were bargaining with an audience in the room. And at the next session, they asked to return to ground rules and they agreed to open sessions. And we had various, there were, very, you know, there are various degrees of openness and we got a pretty darn open and I can talk about details if you're interested. I wanna to note too that our commitment to transparency goes beyond open bargaining. We typically didn't permit sidebars between the lead negotiators. We sent bargaining updates to the entire unit within a couple of days of a session. And we posted every single proposal from both sides on our website. Now, when we moved to virtual bargaining in spring of 2020, I wasn't on the team at that point. The team had to rework the ground rules and they became narrower, unfortunately. Um, partly this was due to the fact that nobody had a lot of experience yet with Zoom. Um, the admin team was really afraid of Zoom bombing. They were afraid of being recorded. We were like, you know, people could have recorded you in the room, <laughs> um, just sort of unreasonable things. So our team agreed at that point in order to, to get to finish this, to finish this process, to limit attendance to members of our bargaining unit, whereas before it was pretty much anyone could attend. But we also offered to take the administrative burden of setting up the room, and they agreed. And that meant that we could control it, right? We could use a Zoom room instead of a webinar so people could actually be present and their presence could be seen. Um, we could send a link out in advance to our members. We could have breakout rooms where we could talk and organize. Um, and just a, one funny thing that happened on Zoom, at one session, a state senator showed up we hadn't invited her, but she showed up and the admin was really annoyed about it, but they agreed to let her in wisely, thinking it would look bad if they didn't. Um, so just to sum up sort of why, why we're committed to open bargaining. Um, first, as I said, there's transparency. We want a democratic union. Second, our bargaining team represents both our members and non-members who are in our bargaining unit. And the team should therefore be accountable to those people. It should do its work in the open. Third, it puts pressure on the administration. It shows them that faculty are paying attention, that faculty have a stake in this process. It allows us to press them on things more effectively because they have to be held accountable for what they say. You know, if we push them as we did to get them to admit finally at the table that inequities in salary were a problem, they have now said that, everybody heard them say it, and we can continue that conversation, right, moving forward. We fully believe that we want a much better CBA because we bargained openly. And fourth, it, it helps with organizing. 
seeing what's happening at the table mobilized people, activated people, got us new members. I know several people who signed membership cards um, after seeing what was happening. They see both our team, right? They see their colleagues, their faculty colleagues, cogently and compellingly arguing for their interests at the table and usually making more informed arguments than the other side. And they see how intractable, frustrating, and sometimes offensive the administration team is. Now there are costs, okay? It takes work. We had to do turnout. Um, now we ended up doing this pretty strategically. So we would um, pick particular sessions to do real heavy turnout on, but you know, it makes no sense to have open bargaining and then not have faculty there in the room. You also need a disciplined bargaining team, <laughs> you know, cause again, the audience is bigger. Um, and finally, I'll just say that, um, you know, there are also incremental steps that some unions take toward open bargaining that can be built on in future sessions. So just posting proposals on the website, sending out bargaining updates, hosting sessions where you update your members about what's going on at the table or winning access for a limited number of people. All of those move closer to transparency. And that's, that's what I've got. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Um, I don't know, do we have a minute or two to open it up to everybody before we go into breakouts or uh, what do you think? If you, um, want, if you have a question you want to ask Marissa or? I think we have Q&A afterwards. Um, okay, Marissa, you can stay, stay around for that. Oh, fun, fantastic. Okay, great. Um, I just couldn't take notes fast enough. <laughs> Uh, so we are ready for breakout rooms to talk about what we just heard about open bargaining and whether this is something we can do and want to do here to win our contract demands. Right, we're now, uh, we're now gonna get to our uh, report back. Yes. Right, um, Emily, how many, I didn't get a chance to see how many groups there were. How many did we divide up into? There are five. Um, so I can just, I can just call on the different groups of who led each one. Um, yeah, what, and, and see who wants to give, um, and just give a brief summary of some of the things that were discussed and shared in, in your group. Great, so um, James Duran. Uh, given the small number of people, uh, you know, only a handful, uh, we certainly had a wide range of, um, of experiences and, and opinions. Uh, some, some new to teaching at Rutgers entirely, others new to the union, and some uh, very committed from the, from the, the get-go to, to what we're trying to do here. Um, and so that took up quite a bit of our time trying to figure out who was where. And not everybody had a firm opinion on, uh, on open bargaining. Um, I did not take the notes, uh, Anjali did. So maybe she would like to contribute to this as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the main concerns that came up more, more than concerns questions were about logistics with COVID and like, um, also travel, like if people are coming from different campuses and we're trying to convene. Um, so yeah, most of the questions were about like um, being able to get participation and enough people to come to a lot of the bargaining sessions and then also figuring out COVID. And, and there's still a great deal of uh, concern in, uh, in some minds at least that um, uh, we don't have as many people joined with us as we should. We don't have a high enough percentage. Uh, it could always be more, could always be better. So that's not strictly on open bargaining, but that's a, a concern that people expressed. Okay, great. The, um, the next group, uh, Dan, that was your group, who wants to give your summary? Uh, you're muted, Dan. 
Uh, yeah, sorry, couldn't get another volunteer, so uh, I'll give the report. But we, we did have uh, people who were very enthusiastic about coming to uh, open bargaining sessions. Uh, um, so uh, yeah, Heather and Islam said they would definitely uh, be there if we do this. It's a great idea. Um, the, the main thing that we uh, did in our session was to uh, discuss some questions about uh, how, how this would differ from negotiations in the past. So we, we went over that again. Um, our our uh, group also uh, won the jackpot. We had Marissa in our group, um, and and she made uh, the important point uh, that uh, you don't win your contract at the negotiating table. So as important as open bargaining is, um, it, it's a way of involving people. It's a way of organizing people. But um, just making a good argument is not going to win you a good contract. Um, you, you need to uh, organize your members. Uh, you know, possibly. Uh, uh, you know, uh, come up with uh, actions that that would uh, uh, you know force the university to to take us seriously. Use use the power that we have uh, as the people that keep the university running. So. Right there, good point. Um, so on to the third group, uh, which is my group. Uh, we were just discussing who was going to give the report back when, of course, the breakout room <laughs> ended. Uh, Howie, you took the notes, so so maybe it would just be convenient. All right. Does anyone else want to give the report? Uh, all right. Well, in the interest of uh, efficiency, I'll do it. So um, in our group, we uh, we started off the discussion with Lance, who said he was excited about the prospect of open bargaining and, and plans to attend uh, whatever sessions um, he can and is and is invited to. And uh, Joe. Um, who said that it was cons this was consistent with his ideas about the way unions should operate democratically. And he thought that in theory, this was really the way to go. But he was concerned about whether or not the PTL union is ready to pull this off, because it's not just about believing in it, it's about being ready and organized and, and powerful enough. Um, and of course, he's absolutely right. Um, and um, uh, Ilsan reported on, on the grad, who, who's a member of the grad a full time unit, uh, reported that the grads are down for this. Um, and they, uh, they have, um, on the other hand, there's still an uphill battle within the union to convince everyone that this is the way to go. Um, uh, there are uh, some people who, um, have have more to lose than we do put it that way and um mm -hmm. but uh the the uh this mood is is perhaps shifting and uh the ptl union i i said the ptl union is is including tonight this is part of our effort to influence the 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 attitude of um the full-time union and their leadership and they are coming around although i won't make believe they're fully with us yet um, we're going to be bar bargaining jointly, so it's going to obviously be important that we are all on the same page here. Um, so that's a, a chapter yet to be written. Um, mm -hmm. Paul asks, what are the steps uh, involved in open bargaining? Where do we go from here to there? And and of course, and of course, one of the answers to that is the articles committee are the hopefully in our picture of things are the are the kernels of of the open bargaining process. These are the people who are going to be the subject matter experts. And in our, in our ideal vision of this, right, the they will present the demands when we come to their issues, and they will accept. They will take the university's responses and rebut them, and and you know, and work them out, and all of that stuff. So that's of course the, the best version. Um, of open bargaining. David uh, made the point that we need to be prepared to fight, <laughs> that this is not something that's going to happen on its own, that it's going to require the exercise of power. And finally, we talked about the role of the attorneys uh, in, in this. And um, we uh, we are going to have to break the news <laughs> to them that we're going to be doing this bargaining ourselves. They are not going to be the ones calling the shots. Uh, as they're used to. And um, Ilsan said uh, she, a healthy distrust of attorneys is uh, a, a good thing because they limit our um, ability to imagine what's possible. And I thought that would, I think that's a really good way to end our report. Uh, well right, said. Right. <laughs>
and I just want to throw in one really quick addition to that, that, I mean, not only and obviously the general point that Ed Bryan had also made about the necessity to fight, but if this is our first demand, you know, the, the structure of the, of the negotiating and we demand open bargaining and they say no, it's not really an option for us to just shrug and go, okay, let's <laughs> move on to the next thing. I mean, if we're not prepared to win this fight, what does that say about our potential for winning the, the, the demands that we're asking? So something that we all need to be thinking about. What are, what are we prepared to do? Uh, Matt, your group is up. Yeah, so I did forget to ask if someone wanted to give the report back. So I will just give it myself quickly. Um, we had a great conversation, um, a lot of new faces to me, and I think a few people that um, maybe hadn't been to a town hall before, so it was great. Um, so yeah, we kind of just talked about the degrees of open bargaining that were possible, you know, completely open versus some sort of hybrid. Um, and even the hybrid would be good to achieve, um, but obviously full open bargaining would be our goal. Um, and then I was something that I really liked about our discussion was talking about the intimidation of it. Um, and I know Marissa said, had a good point um, about the admin uh, feeling intimidated by the, the presence of the entire union there. And that's just something that since we first started talking about open bargaining has been really exciting to me. So I was happy to see that um, it was exciting to the rest of the group. Um, and then I brought up the question just because I was curious, you know, what pros versus cons that we all saw um, as far as virtual bargaining versus in-person bargaining. Um, and it seems like, you know, there a lot of the, um, I think a lot of the, the pros and cons that I've personally thought of in the past that um, other people shared, you know, the flexibility of virtual, how all three campuses can participate um, without having to go to New, Bruns New Brunswick is great, but the energy that the in-person bargaining would bring is probably um, much better and much more um, morale boosting. Um, so that was a good conversation um, to have, and I think that brought us to, to the end of our time. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Matt. Amy, I think your group is uh, maybe the last one. Yeah, I said I would report back, um, but we, we have limited time. So I'm just going to quickly say it was a positive response. People liked it. Um, the, what we've been doing is part of open bargaining. We've been mobilizing our members and talking to our members. So I, I, I asked the two people I didn't know in the breakout room what they remember about the last contract because they were both here and like not much. You know, they, they, we didn't get any information. We didn't have any basis for even, you know, thinking about open bargaining. So we're already in a better place now than where we would have been last time. Um, but there was um, Karen brought up Karen, who has the institutional history, said they are going to resist this. They're going to say no. And we have to think about, like David said, what do we do then? Right? Are we ready to fight for this? Uh, is this something that's important to us? And can we fight and win this? I think we can. Um, but we have to really know that that's going to be a fight. Um, so uh, I, I think I'll leave it there since the uh, interest of time and we have a couple more things to, to do. Great. Thanks, Amy. So the, um, the next that we were going to have Q&A now for uh, for Marissa, correct, uh, Amy and Emily? Is that yes. that's the next? So uh, maybe the thing to do is if people could just write the word stack in chat, if you'd like to ask a question and or make a comment uh, that Mariska would respond to. And the only thing we ask is please try to keep things brief so we can maximize democracy and get as many questions um, uh, as, as we can. So feel free to, there we go. Uh, Goddison, go ahead. Um, my, my opinion is the in the past, the administration have had like uh, maybe few few leadership and uh, the attorneys, you know, and they come and discuss. Um, for us to be able to make impact, I believe strongly in the first negotiation, it should be open and true to everybody. It should be in person on campus. Um, I personally am a very busy person. I'm ready to volunteer to drive and come that day. You know, um, that will send the message. That first impact we need to make on that first day is very important. After that first day, we can make it hybrid or maybe we wanna count down the number of people who we go for the next round or we wanna make it in Zoom. You know, that's what I'm going to say. You know, the first day of negotiation is important. We need as much people as possible because that will send a signal to the authorities that is no longer business as usual. Thank you. 
Yes, and I like that, the authorities. That's a, that's a good way to think about them. Um, Marissa, do you want to respond to that and maybe anything else you, you, you heard in the report backs that struck you as, as, as significant? Yeah, one thing I would respond is that, be, so we have three main campuses. And so similar to you, right, <laughs> um, that poses some uh, sort of a problem in terms of turning people out. And what we did is in our ground rules, we got them to agree that we would hold at least one bargaining session at each of those other campuses. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, yeah, and I, I guess to, to uh, to this point of first impressions, you know, it, it, it really was powerful that first time we brought people into the room. Um, it made a big difference. Um, as, as we, we knew that we were able to continue to negotiate without ground rules. And so that gave us, right, some, we wanted ground rules, but it gave us some kind of um, uh, comfort um, that if they said no, you know, what we would have done, I suppose, is try to get them to come to a point where they refuse to negotiate. And if they say that clearly enough, then they're violating labor law. So that's all. Anybody else? You know, I, I'm just going to put in the chat, somebody asked how you get started. And one of the things we learned from one of the trainings we did was that you, you have different task forces and you divide up into task forces. There's things that we all can do. Even if you can't attend the bargaining session, you can be on the social media task force that gets the word out to the public, or you can be the, you know, the note takers in the room. There's even people who just watch the administration, and their faces, and they report on that. Um, so there's a, there's a job for everybody and you kind of sign up for the job you want this um but okay so we should we should move to um what we all have to do now so we have a a, a couple of people just talking about the things ha coming up so first we have um gary gary roth hi yes and i just want to mention the uh, phonathon that's happening tomorrow at six o'clock it is a uh, great fun so you don't want to miss it uh, it's important to our future. I mean, that's the, the, the main reason. But also you have some very uh, appreciative people that you will talk to who meant to sign cards uh, and uh, are pleased to get a reminder uh, or thought they had signed a card. And, and so good to hear that, that they still need to. And you will also have some very interesting and challenging calls. Uh, I spoke to one person uh, last time at length, for instance, and, and my sense from him was that ultimately he would go with whichever side he thought was winning, and he didn't think we were winning yet. But we had a long talk, and he appreciated the things that I said to him about how the drive is going and how long it's been going and how many members and cards signed and so on. But uh, but you'll have those kinds of tough conversations as well. Uh, but but he did appreciate the, the ideas that I gave him. So there's a phone-a-thon tomorrow, and everyone, if you're not signed up and you've got the time, uh, please please join us. I don't think you'll be disappointed. And can I just point out that Molly posted in the chat the RSVP for the sign up. So please, everybody, take a look at that and see if you can help out. Great. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, that sounds like such a, 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 sorry, a Trump thing to say, like, we're not winning yet. You got to be winning. It's all about <laughs> winning. And you got to know if you're going to win, then I'll sign up. Uh, and we have two more things. So Rutgers Day and Anjali um, is going to tell us what Rutgers Day is. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Anjali. I first got involved with the union when I was a student, and I found being connected to the union to be really valuable to my experience at Rutgers. And it encouraged me to also make demands as a student and think about what I would like my university that is using my tuition money to stand for, which is why I'm very excited to encourage everyone to join us on Rutgers Day, Saturday, April 30th, from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., um, you can sign up for a shift to table and flyer and speak with students about the union. Um, we also are going to have a union gathering um, with food and games from 3 to 6 p.m. at the union office slash house on 11 Stone Street in New Brunswick. And yeah, it would be lovely if people could come in person. And yeah, the details will, and sign up links will be shared via email soon. But yes, come out. <laughs> 
Thanks, Anjali. Um, and uh, summer canvassing with Goddessen, <laughs> superstar canvasser. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Godsin Oji. Um, I'm glad to be part of the union and uh, everything the union have been doing. And uh, the canvassing, we started the canvassing that was uh, last month, March. Um, we first went to Highland Park and uh, um, it was encouraging uh, meeting some of those faculty members, interacting with them one on one, um, you know, trying to mobilize and uh, make them to understand the need why all of us need to uh, stick together, have that strong bargaining power um, in what we are fighting for, both pay parity, um, job security, and healthcare. And at the same time, you know, ask them to sign a major card. And uh, there are some of them also who are not member of the union and they have to sign up on during those conversing. Um, it was, you know, an exciting event. And um, there are also some people also we go, we knock at their door also, they are not there. Uh, we try to sneak the flyers in their door. We try to, um, you know, make some calls and tell them we came today and, uh, you know, drop a voice message or sometimes write our email address and phone number so that they can reach out to us. And uh, this month of April, we have had uh, two canvassing. Um, one was at JC City and then the other one is at uh, Philadelphia. Um, I'm encouraging every member of uh, the union to come participate. Um, you know, we want to make a change. We want to make a difference. Uh, I do tell myself someone negotiated the salary I'm earning today. And if I have the opportunity to be part of this process, I need to make it better. That's the way I look at it. Um, I, I see people, you know, including during both the canvas, the phone banking, giving excuse. Oh, I'm not taking this section. You know, I don't think I should be part of it. I said, no, I personally, this section I'm not teaching. But I'm excited to be part of the process, both in the canvassing, in the phone bag, everything that will make the union better and stronger. I want to see us, um, you know, win those contracts and maybe have a multiple year contract or including the opportunity for uh, being tenured or tenure track and stuff like that. Um, it's, you know, it keeps my spirit when I hear people who have been in the system 20 years, more than 20 years, you know, um, the, you know, they have not been able to progress, you know. So I, I want us to really join hand and uh, see what we can do and make changes and uh, be happy at the end of it, you know. Thank you, everybody. Oh. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Wow, I couldn't have ended on a better note. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, join us canvassing, knocking on doors. Goddess is fun to go with. <laughs> then we have food afterwards, which is really great. It's the, the images in the chat. So it's great to see you all. Um, we you know, email us or call us or participate, sign up, um, and we'll see you. We'll see you really soon. Uh, hope you have a good end, end of the semester, everyone. Take Thank good you. care. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Take care.